just going to give you a, an overview of, of my work and some of the larger questions that have been driving my work. So over the past couple of decades, and I must say, um, in terms of that question about digital natives always being young, it's so nice to get old. And you can say stuff like, over the past two decades, I've been working on something. Or if you forget people's names, they're just like, oh, yeah, she's geriatric. OK. So over the past um, couple of decades, I've been grappling with the question, how have computers become a form of mass media. In particular, how have computers become what we now understand to be new media? Right? Um, how has this, the transformation of computers from military industrial instruments of torture, right, which was what, how we viewed them growing up, um, to empowering and ubiquitous media devices transformed the function of media, and indeed, importantly, transformed the very notion of mass. Right? So what's at stake, in other words, um, from the move from mass to new, right, where mass always has to be um, um, sous retour, and also from the we to the you, right, which I'm placing within that same rubric. To be clear, <clears throat> my concerns are not mainly historical. So I don't think the answer to these questions emerge from the history of technology. Rather, I focus on the relationship, the vexed relationship, between media, culture, and technology. Um, so the relationship between forms of governmentality and forms of technology. So at the, uh, at the most extreme sense, or most extremely, you could say that my work has looked at um, governmentality as a form of technology and technology as a form of governmentality. But I want to stress here um, that the as is central, right? Because the as marks a simile rather than um, equality or the, the same thing, right? Um, so it's a comparison rather than equality, and it's a comparison that's arguably based on an important mistranslation. Um, every comparison is also a mistranslation. And so to offer you an example that hopefully makes clear um, this project and also that frames my first two book projects, I want to turn now to my handy dandy packet sniffer. Um, and so for all of you unfamiliar with packet sniffers, they're software um, packages that analyze local area network traffic. Um, although used by hackers and the FBI, they were developed by sysops to diagnose networks that are always failing. Um, they are now, however, and I just found out when I was giving um, a talk in England, they are actually illegal in the UK. Um, and right now, you're seeing, and let me just stop this because this is being taped and I don't know if it's illegal here. Um, so right now, you're seeing all the packets addressed to and sent by my computer where, where I seem to be doing nothing, right? So some of you may think that your computer only sends and receives data at your request, right? Um, as you can see, though, and this is just, you know, the past five minutes, um, your computer constantly sends and receives, um, stores and writes and receives um, packets. Many of these packets are really innocuous, in fact, and, and only say, can you read me? So rather than simply allowing us to exercise what, what um, Walter Benjamin once called our legitimate claim to be reproduced, the Internet circulates our reproductions without our consent or knowledge in order to give us, and this is the important thing, access to others' traces. Also, rather than simply shattering tradition and bursting open our prison world, um, these rampant reproductions, and importantly, um, for a computer to read is to write elsewhere. To read is to write elsewhere. Um, and so, uh, what a computer actually does, if you think about it in that way, is actually literalize control, right? So the English term control is based on the French term contre rule, um, a copy of a role of an account, et cetera, of the same quality and content as the original. So this literalization of control 
doubled by the internet running transmission control protocol, internet protocol, right? So the internet is itself a control protocol. Um, is not, importantly, this literalization of control is not an added feature. It's not an added feature of surveillance that goes on top of the usual way the internet operates. Right? It's absolutely central. Without this control, without this very much error-prone automation of decisions, there would be no communications, there would be no internet. Um, but what's not essential and arguably the problem is the ways in which this control, this error-prone, faulty control, is simultaneously hidden and amplified. Simultaneously hidden and amplified, both techno technologically through various interfaces which hide the sort of uh, constant conversation that's necessary, um, and also ideologically through narratives of the user as a super agent, right? So therefore is always in control. Um, now, this packet sniffer, which was running, um, was running, importantly, in uh, promiscuous mode, right? which means that it was actually accessing all the traffic going through the network. So, down to, so here, in other words, is a trace of everybody's packets. Um, now, importantly, promiscuous mode does not change your Ethernet's usual reading habits, right? If you think of the way your Ethernet card works, it works by downloading everything and then actively erasing what's directly not addressed to it, right? How else would network communications work? And what this means is that your Ethernet card, you have um, intentionally or not already downloaded all sorts of illegal material, right? As long as you've been part of a network, you've probably downloaded all sorts of things which are considered to be illegal or pirated. So this promiscuous reading, this necessary promiscuous reading, quite nicely demonstrates the fact that a personal networked computer seems to be an oxymoron. Right? A personal network computer seems to be an oxymoron produced through a massive screening operation. A massive screening operation that simultaneously democratizes and privatizes publicity and surveillance, right? That moves the usual binary of um, public versus private into one of open versus closed, right? And you can see this move epitomized arguably through the mass internet itself becoming a mass medium, right? It became a mass medium by the selling of the public internet backbone to private corporations, right? So in um, Control in Freedom, uh, which was uh, my first book, I asked, how has such a compromising and compromised form of communication been bought and sold as empowering? Right? How did a communications medium based on a control protocol, TCP IP, Transmission Control Protocol, Internet Protocol, become celebrated as a mass medium of freedom? Right? Further, given that networked computers engaged in non-sessant and non-volitional dialogue, right, that sort of dialogue that was captured in our packet sniffer, given this, why do we believe interactivity to be driven by the voluntary exchange of information? Right? What, what, in other words, is at stake in the construction of interactivity is voluntary and the user is in control of um, information. And lastly, why do so many of us react with such paranoia um, to our packet sniffers, right? to the idea that everything is going back and forth and constantly ex you know, accessible, rather than viewing this um, as simply necessary to, as enabling communication? Right? So in other words, just viewing it as a way a window operates, right? a breach, a necessary breach between public and private. Now, key to this transformation, I argued, was the rewriting of political problems, such as problems of racial discrimination, as problems that technology could and should fix, right? A rewriting that necessitated a certain paranoia. After all, in order to think like a computer, in order to think technologically and actually hang on to your data, um, you have to be a little paranoid, right? So in terms of race, I argued that race as skin deep has been central to understanding the internet as screen deep. 
So in the United States especially, the internet was sold as empowering, um, as something desirable and necessary. Remember when the internet first um, came on, there wasn't a sense, there were people asked, would anybody go? Who would use the internet, right? Um, was sold as empowering, desirable, and necessary through images of happy people of color who insisted that race was only skin deep. Um, that freedom, in other words, stemmed from controlling one's representation. Right? So how can we forget commercials like these? Right, so this is just one commercial of many, and it, it appeared in the mid to late 1990s that it was impossible to advertise the internet without featuring happy people of color um, who were arguing uh, that technological empowerment equaled racial empowerment. Right, by transforming the desire to be free from discrimination to the desire to be free from one's body. Right? So the, the, the message of commercials like these weren't even the really banal, don't discriminate, but you know, go online if you want to be, avoid being discriminated against. Right? Because that's where one can be truly free because one can control one's representation. Right? Um, now, a paranoid logic also um, drives these images of progress and regress, right? So behind the seeming celebration of people of color is also a threat, a threat of being left behind by this racialized other um, who's represented as both irrevocably caught in the past, right? So then President Bush called the 9-11 hijackers cave dwellers, right? Who's both um, irrevocably posed as being caught in the past and is pointing towards the future where the future equals technology, right? And you can see this most compactly in the pre versus post 9-11 interpretations of this image, right? So the move from, yay, people of color riding camels in the desert have access to the internet, to, oh shit, you know, people riding camels in the desert have access to the internet, right? But the message is still the same, buy IT because they are because of this other who's always represented as already having or harboring technology, which gives him an advantage over us, which he may use against us, even as his use of technology, however expert, is always represented as both novice and as a misuse. Right? So responding to this paranoia, um, I insisted that freedom cannot be reduced to control. For freedom, both grounds and confounds control. Freedom, in other words, makes control possible, necessary, and never enough. Freedom, in other words, is an experience um, in the terms of Jean-Luc Nancy's notion of experience, putting one's body in peril. Um, so I ended this book by suggesting that the political and democratic significance of the internet does not lie in the way we usually conceive of the internet as de democratic, which is empowering individuals to act in certain ways, but rather from what our interfaces constantly try to elide, right? Um, so from the ways that we and our machines are constantly involved in interchanges that make us vulnerable. Right? So hence the packet sniffer and the question, what happens if we think about networks in this way and take this vulnerability seriously? Is there a different way we can conceive of and think through the democratic promises of the internet? Um, but I started with the packet sniffer also because it raises another set of questions that have been um, central to my second book, um, Program Visions. Namely, um, given that computers generate visuals rather than represent what simply exists elsewhere, why do we so readily believe that my packet sniffer was actually analyzing network traffic? Right? So half the time I give this presentation, I'll use a fake packet sniffer. Right? Um, so the question is, what is the power of these visual representations? Um, why the persistence of visualization and our faith in these visualizations as a way to track and navigate? Right? So given that our machines increasingly read and write without us, 
given that our machines um, become more and more unreadable so that seeing no longer guarantees knowing if it ever did, right? given that media mediates, why do we treat our machines as transparent, as visual machines? Why have computers ever become part of this rubric called visual culture? Right? And I try to understand this within um, an alleged frenzy of uh, and decline in visual knowledge that I see computation very much participating in. Um, so in my most recent book, I've argued that computers are neoliberal governmental machines. Um, that they, they encapsulate a certain neoliberal governmentality, not simply through their use, um, so not simply through the problems that they make it possible to pose and solve. Like th that at a certain level seems obvious, population, climate, et cetera, et cetera. But also, and more importantly, in their very logical structure. Right? That is, software's vapory materialization and its ghostly interfaces embody conceptually, metaphorically, virtually a way to navigate our increasingly complex world. So based on metaphor, they become a metaphor for metaphor itself. That is for a logic of a general substitutability, a logic of ordering, as well as, and this is what's creative and interesting, um, a creative and animating disordering. But the clarity offered by software as metaphor should make us pause. Because if software has become a metaphor, it's a very strange metaphor, right? Metaphors usually explain an unknown through a known. But software as metaphor explains an unknown through another unknown, right? For who knows what lurks behind our smiling interfaces, <laughs> behind those objects we click and manipulate. Who completely understands what one's computer is actually doing at any given time, right? So I'm trained as an engineer, and I can tell you theoretically what your computer is doing at every level, but I cannot tell you what it's doing at this precise moment. Um, symptomatically, as our machines disappear, getting flatter and flatter, the density and opacity of their computation increases. The less we know, the more we're shown the more we're caught in a simultaneous frenzy of and decline in visual knowledge. Now, I want to emphasize that this paradox is not an unfortunate anomaly. Um, because uh, as I see it, it grounds computing's appeal. Right? So the computer understood as an interfacial machine, a software hardware machine, um, its combination of what it can, can be seen and cannot be seen, its combination of what can be known and cannot be known. Its separation of interface from algorithm, its logical separation of software from hardware, makes it a powerful metaphor for everything we believe is invisible, yet produces visible logical effects, right? From genetics to the invisible hand of the market, from ideology to culture. So my point's not simply to reveal the bizarre and illogical intertwining with computers we cannot understand with understanding itself, but rather to trace how this intertwining of rationality with mysticism, knowability with what's unknown, grounds its appeal, um, making it a powerful factish that offers its programmers and users alike a sense of empowerment a sense of a small S sovereignty that covers over barely a sense of profound ignorance. So it's, a, it's very much investigated and in trying to understand that emergence once more of a certain logic of sovereignty. Um, to unpack this relation, I focused on, on the surprising emergence of software as a thing. Right? So it's moved from this, um, the temporary um, configuration of cables, um, later, it was a service. It was actually charged per instruction. It's transformation from this um, to this, right? A neatly packaged commodity. Um, and let me just note and, that in thinking of this, and this goes to the questions of, of biopolitics that were raised earlier, I also tried to think of, um, in terms of, of why and how did software emerge as a thing, to rethink um, history of science standard narratives that saw programs as emerging within computers and then moving to biology. And rather said, well, what if we think through eugenic programs? 
and certain early 20th century dreams of words that did things is actually grounding the possibility and making um, of, of a desire for a programmability. Um, and so it, it, it's a sort of strange process. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that thinking about software as thing is also not simply a condemnation of program, right? but a, a really rich thinking of everything that a thing can be. Um, and so arguably, if we start thinking through software as things in this sense, we can think of them as magical in different ways. We can imagine and think through them um, in ways that perhaps are peculiar now. Um, and that takes me to my current project, um, Imagine Networks Global Connections. And I don't know how many of you have read the readings that I gave you, but those are from this project. Um, so I just want to briefly outline some of the questions driving um, the project um, and hopefully engage in some discussion. So Imagine Networks continues to engage the issues that I outlined earlier, in particular, the implications of the transformation of computers from mass media, uh, from computers into mass media, so, which again changes the very notion of mass and seems to flirt with or, or refigure that question of the you, as well as the sort of bizarre and illogical intertwining with computers we cannot understand with understanding itself, right, with, with, the, with visual culture. But rather than thinking through the question of interfaces, Imagine Networks tries to think through the power um, of networks. Now, to emphasize the importance of networks is hardly new or profound, right? Um, from John Francois Lyotard's evocative description of the postmodern self as a nodal point, to Manuel Castell's exhaustive description of network society in relationship to informational capitalism, from Hart and Negri's examination of US sovereignty as a form of network power, to Tiziana Terranova's, I think, really brilliant analysis of the global um, network culture, networks have been the subject of much theoretical investigation. They've also become a prized theoretical tool, right? From Deleuze and Guattari's discussion of rhizomatic structures to Bruno Latour's call for actor network theory, networks have been central to theory. Um, the reach of networks, however, is far larger than academic theory. Indeed, one could argue that networks have become the defining concept of our epoch. Right? So from high-speed financial networks that erode or allegedly erode national sovereignty to networking sites like Facebook.com that transform the meaning of the word friend, from um, Twitter feeds that transform political alliances to unprecedented globe-spanning viral vectors that threaten worldwide catastrophe, networks allegedly encapsulate the new, right? So the new global formation, the new social institutions, the new forms of global contagion. Now, this assertion of networks as the diagram for our social formation, to use Alex Galloway's form formulation, has spawned much pred predictable controversy, right? Are networks really new? No, networks aren't new. They're, in fact, quite old. Um, and I'm less interested in this question, are networks really new, um, not because I don't think uh, history is important, but rather because such a de debate usually assumes that we understand already what a network is and what it does. So my question is less, do we live in a network society or are our networks really new? And more, why do we believe the network, however described, to diagram our current form social formation? That is, what is the explanatory power of networks? Um, now the attraction, the power of networks, seems to stem from their ability to resolve, to conceptualize, to imagine what was once conceived to be unimaginable. Right? Um, in fact, what it seems to offer us is the ability to conceptualize the relationship between the individual and larger global forces, to link the authentic to the true, in other words, to resolve a certain postmodern uncertainty and to finally allow us to map capital, climate, 
risk. And but although here I would um, point that what's important in networks and what's not really discussed is that unknowability is central to networks as well, right? The demand to know where something is in a network is also a way to destroy a network, a functioning network, right? So think of the demand to know where the toxic assets were as freezing that very alleged network of capital, right? Um, but to let me, to, to make this point about the, the desire of resolution as the power, the affective power of networks, let me turn to Fred Jameson's really influential diagnosis of postmodernism. So Jameson famously argued in the mid-1980s um, that capitalism since the 19th century has made it harder and harder to conceive of our position in the world, right? This is um, because he argued um, the truth of our seemingly authentic experiences lies elsewhere, right? So in the 19th century, for instance, the truth of 19th century English capitalism lay in India, right? This continuity between what's authentic and true um, was made even more drastic, he argued, in the age of postmodernity. Um, for right now, we live in cities and spaces that are more unmappable, right? We live in a new postmodern space that suppresses diff distance, so there's no sense of anything is erratic. It relentlessly saturates remaining voids and empty places, so there's no gaps, no sacred spaces. And this postmodern space, the postmodern body, um, whether wandering through a postmodern hotel, locked into rock sounds by means of a headphones, only Fred would, what's lock, anyway, exposed to <laughs> perceptual, perpetual barrage of immediacy from which all sheltering layers and intervening mediations have been removed. And this saturation of space, Jameson argues, leads to a new historically original dilemma in which we're inserted as individuals into a multi-dimensional set of radically discontinuous realities whose frames range from the still surviving spaces of bourgeois private life all the way to the unimaginable decentering of global capital and self. Um, and this decentering, this historically new dilemma makes it impossible, he argues, for us to map the totality of our relations, right? To map our relations to totality, to realize our place within late capitalism. Um, so Jameson called for a new form of political art, uh, a new form of political art, which would be a form of cognitive mapping in order to resolve our postmodern dilemma, right? To let us grasp our po position as individuals and as collective subjects, and thus, he argues, regain our ability to act. So very much a linking of mapping and empowerment in action. Now, this call to imagine the impossible relationship between the individual and the larger situation resonated throughout the 20th century, right? So think here of Mark Granovetter's famous diagnosis of the um, importance of weak links, right? And he starts that article by arguing that the personal experience of individuals is closely bound up with larger scale aspects of social structure well beyond the purview or control of particular individuals. Um, think as well as Ulrich, in terms of Ulrich Beck's discussion of a risk society, right? And he says, uh, intentionally or not, through accident or catastrophes in war or peace, a large group of the population faces devastation and destruction today, for which language and the powers of our imagination fail us, for which we lack any moral or medical category. Um, we are concerned with the absolute and unlimited not, which threatens us here, the un in general, unimaginable, unthinkable, Un, un, un. Um, now, networks as a conceptual tool, um, as actually existing entities, as a way to bring together actual existing entities and theoretical tools, seem to answer this call, right? Enabling a certain relationship, concrete relationship between the individual to the whole, right? So networks seem to offer us the promise of connection a traceable connection from the point to the globe, right? The zoom to the overview. Network maps mediate between the local and the global, the detail and the overview. And the resolution, what's important about the, the sort of affective explanatory power of networks is that promise to move from the zoom to the larger scale. And now, although networks are not exclusively technological, their appeal, their explanatory power seems to be linked to um, technology, right? So Jameson, 
um, uh, although he viewed cognitive mapping as a fundamentally new aesthetic form, argued that cyberpunk and other literature slash art that deals with the thematics of um, mechanical reproduction offered a degraded figure of the great multinational space that remains to be cognitively mapped. And for Granovetter, the mapping of weak links, which makes the importance of bridges, um, was central to co um, social cohesion. But it strikes me, and this is really the starting point, um, is that if networks are a solution to one crisis, they're not a simple solution. And rather than being a solution to a crisis, they're a structure that perpetuates crisis. Um, they seem, in other words, as well, like what, another way to put it is that our historically unique dilemma, if, if such a thing exists, isn't that we're not able to map, but that we're constantly now called on to map, as if through mapping we could receive some sort of closure, right? It's the constant call for us to map. Um, and networks, importantly, are an odd, almost contagious concept. Right? Networks are both actually existing realities and theoretical abstractions. They're both diagrammatic planning tools and what results from these tools. Right? So network analysis produces networks. Network analysis finds networks. They're both description and elucidation. Um, in other words, the phrase, it's a network, is both a description and a prescription, both a description and explanation. They're theoretical, in other words, in all senses of the word theoretical. Um, and networks not only compromise the distinction between illustration and explanation, they also make porous the boundaries between the many different disciplines um, that employ networks, from economics to media studies, from political science to biology. So every discipline, it seems, um, have found networks, and by finding networks have found each other. Right? So the study of networks seems to oddly mirror its subject. The examination of networks seems to lead to the formation of more networks, making it even more difficult to separate network analysis from networks themselves. Um, so to understand this odd power of networks, I've been increasingly thinking of them as imagined. Um, and by focusing on networks as imagined, I'm not arguing that networks are fanciful objects that don't exist, but rather that the force that networks elicit stem in part from the ways in which they configure connections and breaches, flows, links, and gaps between the personal and the social, the political and the technological, the biological and the machinic. Um, now, in this project, I'm drawing from and revising several influential concepts of uh, the imagined and the imaginary. Um, in particular, I'm drawing from and revising Benedict Anderson's really influential but much critiqued and rightly critiqued formulation um, that nations are imagined political communities, right? And they're imagined because we won't meet anyone, yet the image lives, uh, yet the image of the community lives in the minds of each. Um, it's a community because it's allegedly imagined as a horizontal fraternity. Um, Anderson, in making this argument, stresses the importance of print capitalism to the rise of nationalism. Um, it, most importantly, newspapers, which he says puts in place a homogeneous, empty time. Um, so reading, and also with this homogeneous, empty time, extraordinary mass ceremonies, right? Such as the reading of the paper. Um, and the imagined here links the individual to the anonymous collective. It makes possible an imagined we through the creative act of reading. Newspapers, however, clearly are not what they used to be. Um, and as the current crisis of print publications has made clear, we can no longer be sure of these imaginary mass ceremonies. Does this mean, therefore, the death of imagined communities? Um, I think not, although I, I, I do have troubles with the, the word community. Um, but I, so what I'm thinking through is distinctive groupings that are not imagined communities, but rather imagined networks, right? Local collectives that link the social historical to the psychical, the collective to the in, um, individual. So networks that are both more and less than communities. Um, they're combinations that form or allegedly form definite traceable connections or lines of connections between individuals across disparate um, locales. 
And even when these imagined networks coincide with the nation state, and they can, which is what the whole Psy World article was about, um, they also change what we mean by both nation and race. Um, so to let me conclude, uh, I just want to outline two properties of imagined networks that I've been exploring, um, aspects that I draw out a little more in the pieces that you read for today. Um, first is the you. Um, imagined networks are not facilitated through an anonymous we, but rather an individuated yet plural you. And you, importantly, is both individual and plural at the same time. Right? So think of both the you and you two, but also you as the person of the year for Time magazine. Right? Um, you is both singular and plural, but in the, its plural form, it still addresses individuals as individuals, right? The you is a nodal point within the network map. In this sense, um, networks are very different from communities, which facilitated, again, this anonymous we. But importantly, this you, however shifting it is, and another key point is that you is a shifter. It can only operate because it can shift from entity to entity. Um, is not outside issues of race and nationalism. All networks, if we're going to call them networks, whatever this thing is, is not experienced in the same manner or put to the same ends. Um, so again, what I've been fascinated by, especially in terms of the creation of something we might be able to call a pan-Asian network or Asia, um, is the relationship between race, nation, and region. Um, so in the Psy piece world, Psy world piece that you hopefully read for today, I was trying to understand the ways in which allegedly global networks are always localized, right? Um, so I was trying to think through social networks as portals, as intriguing forms of gated communities. Um, and the linkage between forms of social networking and biological understandings of networks as being compacted together in something like an infodemic, right? And really, the, the example of South Korea is fascinating in the sense of how is it that such uh, uh, media products of a rabid nationalism that was also produced through a, uh, a, 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 a embrace of IMF, um, led to a sort of pan-Asian identity with these relentlessly nationalist um, products. And I think that the whole question of the cultural hegemony of South Korea and the ways in which Naver, for instance, is far more popular than Google, um, brings up many questions about this sort of um, formulation. Um, but the, the idea here is that somehow this U is central to changing or moving populations to a people. Um, some sort of affective resonance that happens both at the technological and biological conceptualization. Um, the second thing um, is crisis, right? So if net networks are based on asynchronous events instead of simultaneous collective experience, um, so instead of enabling some sort of homogeneous empty time, a time that buttresses notions of steady progress, they produce a series of crises or a series of nows that create bubbles in time, right? Where in which the new quickly becomes old and the old is constantly rediscovered as new, right? So network time, that is, is not conducive to imagining this imaginary collective thing moving steadily along, but rather a series of views that respond in their own time. Um, so this creates what seems to be at many times a never-ending um, and repeating set of events. Um, so in other words, what it leads to and what is fascinating is the idea of information as undead. Um, so consider, for instance, and this is my favorite example, um, viral email messages about viruses that never existed. Right? <laughs> so out of our goodwill, so this is this never existed. Um, so out of our goodwill, we disseminate the original message, warning there's a, there's a bad virus. And then we discover it's a, not really. So then we spam everyone in our address book with a message telling them that this virus is not really a virus. And in the end, the messages spread everywhere. Right? So these messages, in other words, spread um, as retroviruses. So retroviruses such as HIV are composed of RNA strands that use the cell's copying mechanisms to insert DNA versions of themselves into a cell's genome. 
Right. So similarly, these fleeting ephemeral messages survive by our copying and saving them, by our active incorporation of them into our ever-repeating archive. And so through our attempts to foster safety, we spread retrovirally and defeat our actually working computer's antiviral programs. Right? So we incorporate the undead within ourselves. These messages and their delay turn, the in, turn internet communications rather counterintuitively into a long, thin chain of never-ending communications. And here you see an intriguing chart produced by the computer scientists, um, Devin, uh, sorry, David Levin Noel and John Kleinberg. And this is um, mapping the spread of chain letters. Um, this chart should make no sense. Right? If you take seriously the idea of the internet as being a small world, it should spread like a disease. Right? It should go be fat and short. Right? Um, but because each person responds and forwards at a different level, because it's the you rather than some sort of collective we that's attacked by a virus, what you have is this long, never-ending spread of information. And so. Um, you have this sort of non-simultaneous new in which things spread slowly and deeply. Um, crisis, in other words, to, to link this back to crisis, is not simply resolved by networks or new media, it's also perpetuated by them, especially when networks, technological networks, are embraced as a way to defer crises. Right? So financial software um, that was supposed to make financial crises impossible, um, but spread risk everywhere through complex assets. Think of papers that we save, books that we allegedly save by digitizing them, right? Which we can no longer access because we don't have the software to read them, right? Mm -hmm. Because digital actually decays, if it decays, far faster than the things we want to save them from. Um, think more po you know, positively of global climate change models. Um, models that try to defer the, uh, the um, predictions they offer, right? Um, and the temporality and, and the idea of global climate change models is really intriguing and, and one could argue at a certain level unscientific because what they aim for is unverifiability, right? So if we believe that they're true, we'll act in such a way that we'll never know if they're true, right? There's a really interesting sort of notion of temporality that's embedded in these crises. Um, and, and I would argue, and let me just end here so there's time for discussion again, I try to smush 10 with the rest, um, that what, what crisis seems to offer us is some sort of ability to reference real time, a time of decision, a, a time in which information moves from something that's arguably always there to something that's absolutely crucial. Um, so crises, in other words, is central to the affective power of networks, to the creation of small s sovereign subject use who manage and are called into existence through crisis and their resolution. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm.